Welcome to Into Infinity's ITI interview today with Narada Vantari from Byron Bay, Australia. He's been working many, many, many years in the field of sacred geometry. He met some of the really big guys like Nassim Haramin and Dan Winter. And he also wrote a book, he has a big jewelry business. Welcome, Narada, to this interview. Thank you, Heike. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to having a good chat with you like we did the other day. Yes, it was really nice. Um, so yeah, why don't you just uh, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and how did your journey into the world of uh, geometry start? So I grew up in Australia, went to high school here quite a while ago now. I'm, I've, I've, uh, I'm more than 60 now, so we're looking back more than 40 years ago. And I had terrible math teachers, as probably most people do. For some reason, although mathematics is one of the most fascinating subjects you can dive into, uh, very few of us seem to have good, good maths teachers at school. So uh, I did somehow get interested, though, in higher dimensional geometry while soon after I left school. I was, I was a semi-professional chess player for a while, and I came across the book Flatland, which is a classic probably written in the, around 1860, 1870, uh, which is a sort of fairy tale set in a higher dimension, uh, mostly using lower dimensions to explain higher dimensions, actually. The main character is a square. Mm -hmm. And then other books like uh, Claude Bragdon's A Primer of Higher Space, which is a great beginner's explanation of what higher dimensional space is and what higher dimensional geometry is. And a friend of mine taught me to draw in stereo, which sort of means you draw the left eye's view and the right eye's view of something. And geometries work really well because they're very well-defined shapes. And through that, I sort of combined the two and started drawing hypercubes and discovered a new way of three-dimensionalizing the hypercube, which I might show you a bit later on. Uh, if we do some screen sharing, it's much easier to show than to talk about these things. And then there was a long gap where, although I was somewhat interested in patterns and, and especially through my art, uh, my interest in geometry really influenced my what I create in visual art uh, and the idea of symmetry and so on. But it was probably another... 15 years or so before I somehow found a videotape by Dan Winter, which totally blew my mind with the idea that the shape of our written language can be traced back to geometric shapes and the analysis of the electromagnetic fields of the heart using biofeedback devices could also be analysed into geometric shapes like golden ratio uh, waveforms happening in people's hearts, especially when they're in tune with each other and when they're meditating with each other, they can show that the electromagnetic field suddenly creates golden, wa golden mean uh, waveforms. So from then on, I sort of headed in the direction of learning more about it fascinated by especially the link between patterns in energy and matter and what they mean to us, what the, how they affect us aesthetically in art uh, and how music is also a very geometric form. You can, now this, this ge music is possibly the most geometric art form and Western music theory goes back to Pythagoras, who showed us that the scales are all about simple ratios in the waveforms and so on. So I came in through a little bit of pure geometry in the hypercube and then my interest in the artistic side of it, as well as having a general interest in what reality is and, and science being the study of 
what we learn about reality through uh, diving deeper and in, deeper into it through our instruments and our technology. So it's been a long journey yeah. since I won't, that wasn't the end of the journey by any means. Uh, <laughs> I guess there's two more important phases of it. One is I did start creating artworks that really taught me something that in the process of making a geometric artwork and fitting things together, things would just happen that weren't intended by me. And I think that most sacred geometers find that the more you work with these geometries, the more transmissions, messages, downloads you're getting, or uh, there's other ways of putting it that sort of takes it into the rather it's a new age sort of <laughs> sort of field. But you can also look at it as uh, these geometries do something to our minds and they they tune us into levels of information that I think most of the sacred geometers I know would say they often surprise us. They they show us things we weren't looking for. It's it's quite a a relationship with the geometry or with the spirit that is transmitted through the geometries. And then to come, come across the work of Nassim Haramein uh, in physics, and a lot of his stuff is based on uh, Buckminster Fuller's work. And all of that took me much further into my understanding of sacred geometry than I had been before. So much so that I felt that I had to write a book about it because it wasn't that complex stuff. It, uh, and I felt that I understood really simple ways of explaining it based on the flower of life, circular patterns. And I was sort of surprised that most people don't know these things. It's such a important part of our human understanding of aesthetics and science and spirituality that I wanted to share what had been downloaded to me through these various sources. Yes, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, really, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of in there in, in your life yeah, about uh, geometry. Actually, I want to ask you because um, for a lot of people, when they hear sacred geometry, um, they have a certain image in their mind. And actually, I'm not even using the word anymore because for me, it's really scientific, and so we call it universal geometry. What, um, how would you define sacred geometry? What it is, and how the general public can relate to that. Uh, while I was writing the book, I did a bit of research trying to find out where the term actually comes from. And I don't know who used it first, and I don't even know how far back it goes. What I found is that if you go to Wikipedia, they'll say sacred geometry is mostly concerned with building cathedrals and uh, possibly assigning symbolic meaning to geometries. And this has been something that all religions have done and the secret esoteric societies even more so. And in particular, the Freemasons, because they did build the cathedrals and they did know a lot more about geometry than most of the people living in their culture at that time. And they believed that this was a very powerful knowledge that allowed them to do things other people couldn't do and so on. And I particularly do like the term sacred geometry, partly because it has become in general use to describe working with the flower of life and understanding symbolic meanings for the basic geometries. And also because uh, I feel that it's a field that unites or reunites the study of reality through science, the study of reality through spirituality and contemplation, and, well, you could call it the study of reality through our aesthetic sense, through creating things that we find are beautiful, because, uh, as the ancients said, beauty and truth are very closely related to each other. And the other thing I also discovered was that the term that was probably used that is closest to what we call sacred geometry traditionally was called 
contemplative geometry mm -hmm. and it was seen as being the balance to practical geometry it's the it's the right brain side of geometry that balances the left brain side of geometry which is all about uh, how can we use geometry to influence the world and get more control over it through mathematics to me mathematics and geometry are so intertwined that you can't separate the two of them and mathematics is the more abstract side and geometry is the more uh, concrete spatial visual side of it but there's a there is no point at which one becomes the other really they're so intertwined with each other i would even say it's the same <laughs> It's a, I mean, geometry in the technical terms is the expression of numbers in space. So it's a branch of mathematics. But uh, I feel it's much more tangible than pure mathematics because we cannot really imagine, yeah. uh, you know, certain equations, how they actually look like. But if you see it in geometry, then you intuitively understand it. And, and that's why I yeah. think personally it's been so powerful for my experience and my path because I come from science. But I love art and I love the uh, contemplation part as well, because you can learn many things, but if you don't integrate them, then it doesn't really change your perceptions. And I found it uh, super interesting to combine all these things into a creative experience, really. But, uh, but really where it comes from, it really comes from, yeah, the ancient times, the ancient Greeks with the quadrivium. The seven liberal arts where uh, actually the quadrivium was all about number and geometry expresses all these four branches uh, visually and yeah, the numbers in space numbers in time which is music numbers in time space which is uh, the stars and cos cosmology co astronomy and uh, in the end pure number which is mathematics so yeah it's it's uh, really powerful okay yeah, um, i like to say that i think you could equally say that mathematics is a branch of geometry <laughs> it's not so often stated that way, but yeah, it's true. <laughs> I think it's equally true, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about uh, your book. Um, if you want something to screen share, we can do that. Uh, yeah, I could do that. Let's give it a go because uh, so I'll share screen. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, really? Okay. One yeah, second. You've, you have to enable it for me, apparently. Apparently, hmm. how do I enable well, While you're doing sharing? that, I'll start to talk about it anyway. Yes. So the book's called Understanding Sacred Geometry and the Flower of Life. And the subtitle is A Higher Dimensional Perspective on an Ancient Wisdom Stream, because I did want to trace the history of this knowledge that more recently comes to us through people like Buckminster Fuller. but you can trace it back, its influence going back through the ages, especially through the scientific revolution. People like Isaac Newton, um, Leonardo da Vinci was fascinated by the flower of life and so on. Shall I try again? Yeah, yeah, try. Sure. I think I, I just activated it. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, it looks like we're going to do it. Here we go. We share that. And then we go full screen here. Yes. Correct. Perfect. Did that work? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Looking good. <laughs> go. Okay. So this is actually the online version of my book that we're looking at. You can go there anytime to understandingsacredgeometry.com mm -hmm. and you will find a link where after a couple of clicks to get in, you can get this flip book where you can actually turn the pages of the book. And the whole book is there for you to read at leisure and browse. Uh, it didn't work very well as an ebook because it's so visual. And many of the pages go from left to right without a break and so on. And I felt that it's important enough information to give people access to it without them having to pay anything. And I found that to be a pretty good strategy. I th people have sent me emails saying, I've just bought your book because you gave us free access to it and so on. And books are so such a beautiful thing to hold a book in your hand, especially when it has uh, beautiful pictures. And it starts with some of the history. I, I won't flick through the whole book because that would take us a while. Um, but coming back to telling you about the book, 
it has some history because I want to honor the ancient tradition. It has some basic geometrical theory about the fundamental patterns because there aren't that many. I think you could pretty much reduce it to a dozen core patterns and concepts. And once you understand them and the way they fit together, then you understand a lot about geometry and the nature of space itself because when we're talking about geometry we're talking about space and what space is and what dimensions are so then we flow on to talking about dimensions because that's another subject which i feel is very valuable to understand and very foggy in many people's minds especially because dimensions has taken on a very spiritual new age meaning similar to sort of parallel realities or alternative worlds or astral planes or something like that and there is a lot in that it's not a total misunderstanding of what dimensions are but you have to realize that when the idea of dimensions was invented around 1800 it was invented by geometers who understood that you could go beyond three-dimensional forms and they started to develop the science of how many uh, regular solids are there in the fourth dimension for instance whereas in the third dimension we have five of them and they're the platonic solids and uh, do you have a I picture of the, too much into... the platonic solids in your book would be nice to <laughs> I do uh, let me go a few pages forwards and we'll get to the platonic solids uh, where are we here here we go here's one of the basic forms and we have the up on the top left there we have the five platonic solids where all their angles all their side lengths all the polygons that bind them are the same forms so they're the core symmetries of three-dimensional space but in taking that into the higher dimensions was a new form of geometry and in fact it was pretty much the only new form of geometry that had happened in 2000 years since the days of plato and pythagoras and then beyond that i find that geometry is related to every aspect of life so i wanted to bring it into modern life and show why i think that understanding sacred geometry is relevant to everything from the latest technologies to uh, health the human body meditation practices what's happening in society with um, well, mostly through the revolutions in technology that are happening. I didn't want to get trapped in thinking of sacred geometry as this ancient tradition, which is not relevant to the modern world. I think that it has, through technology, but also through its subtle effects on our consciousness, I think that it can be a key for the for the mind of humanity to take it to a new understanding of what reality is and that's what i've tried to capture in the book that's beautiful all right shall we go back uh, yeah i'm just looking for okay i yeah. can turn off screen sharing there okay. we go uh, yes <laughs> a few technical issues here uh but yeah it worked very fine yeah, it's uh, very beautiful, the book. Um, so one, since you get into this, uh, into sacred geometry, how did it fill your, your life with purpose? Do you feel like you are pursuing a, a mission or? <laughs> <laughs> it sometimes does feel like that. It's you sometimes wonder whether you actually volunteered or whether somebody volunteered you or something. But, but uh, it feels like I guess everybody has something in their life that a direction that they took, which to some degree they chose, but to a large degree, it seems to have been part of your character. You chose it because you related to it. You felt like this was 
this was natural to you. And so you look back years later and go, how did this happen? How did I get on this <laughs> pathway? And geometry seems to have particular power to do that to people if you, because we are fascinated by patterns and we look for patterns in our lives. We, and we feel like in, in writing the book, Understanding Sacred Geometry, I was really surprised that so much of it would be about understanding and not about the sacred geometry part that, and that understanding is about perceiving the patterns in things that we say we understand something when we can see the underlying pattern and we can start to see how it unfolds and how we can predict how the pattern unfolds. Then we say, oh, I understand it. And this applies on so many levels. And it's not such a direct thing in my life that I walk around going, oh, I see how my life unfolds next and I'm going to do this. But there is an element of that. There's a feeling like you're going deeper into appreciating that everything has patterns, including our lives and including our chance encounters, including our intentions and what we try to create and then what just happens in the world. And during these crazy times, <laughs> I think that well, for a start, geometry gives us a, a step out of the craziness in a way to look at the unifying patterns that are at the, at the source of everything. And it doesn't, then, <laughs> then you've got to figure out how this craziness can coexist with this incredible harmony that gives rise to the possibility of this, this life and this universe. And that's an ongoing process, I think, for all of us. Yes. Uh, so what is your, uh, the, the most mind expanding experience you had so far? Can you recite some sort of crazy <laughs> experience? Hmm. That's, that's not an easy one to answer. I think my deepest experiences of the sacred geometry are in actually making things. Um, and I'm, I made an artwork about 12 or 15 years ago called the Universal Yoga Mandala, which was sort of a commissioned project by a friend of mine who's a yogi. And he wanted to bring the five elements into a visual representation of how yoga relates to the five elements. So in the process of making that, which was possibly 400 hours work went into it. Uh, I did it as a photo collage, which I've always been a bit of a photo collage artist, which involves taking images and fitting them together into a form where they all relate to each other in a harmonic way. And in the process of taking probably hundreds of images and putting them together to make an artwork, it really took me to the point where at the end of doing it, I felt like I'd been through a whole initiation and I looked at the finished artwork and saw so many levels of it, which I had not seen in the process of creating it and did not consciously intend to be in there. Uh, and then the most recent thing I've made geometrically is this six dimensional cube, which usually I begin them Ooh, in wow. sticks and glue like this. This is the original, which took, let me see if I can get sort of more of it into the picture there. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> uh, this is the result of many years sort of work building up to it, uh, which we might get into a little bit more detail of in, in a moment, starting with the, the four dimensional cube and working my way up. And this was not something I ever set out to intend. This is the four dimensional cube. Yes. And that was something that I stumbled into. I would have been perhaps 18 years old at the time. And I was really just doodling in 3D and found this new way where 
it's similar to what you'll find in the textbooks, but it three dimensionalizes it in a different way where the cubes are all equally distorted so that you can see the way they go round the form the same way that squares go round a cube. You can see the way these cubes go round the hypercube. So yeah, I guess my most intense interesting experiences have been with the geometries themselves and having them surprise me and having patterns appear that are not consciously intended. I think other artists will relate to this too, that there's a, a point at which you feel like the creative process takes over and goes somewhere better than you were imagining it would go. And you go, yes, now I know I'm making something good because It never goes exactly where you intend it to go, but hopefully it goes somewhere better than you were capable of visualizing it going in the process of actually bringing it through. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's really amazing how it definitely expands the mind. Uh, for me, when I started to work with it, I just start to, yeah, I start to see geometry in places and start to see patterns and, uh, also to attract more things into my life that just uh, that need to be there, like the synchronicity start to to enhance. And I see a lot of triple digit numbers lately, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, so, I mean, I come from science and the whole question is, why, why don't we learn these things in school? What is it that um, science sees different, especially when it comes to yeah, geometry and dimensions. And I think science has a very different approach to this whole thing. What do you think? Yeah, my friend Jane, the mathematician, uh, has done amazing work taking it into schools and trying to get it into the curriculum and so on. I think most, most mathematicians in our society and most math teachers especially really don't understand this stuff. They've missed the whole right brain side of mathematics, as I guess most of our society has. We've become very polarized in that way. And in fact, in about 200 BC, there was a Roman philosopher, Cicero, who said that it was a great shame that their society had lost this aspect of geometry and that the Greeks had considered it uh, the contemplative side of it so important and their philosophers and geometers were respected as being the wisest among their people and so on. But we lost that respect for it in Western society, which sort of begins with Rome, even though Rome integrated a lot of the knowledge from Greece, I would say uh, Western society as we know it is, is Roman society to an extent. Mm. And taking it back to simplicity, uh, um, I hope that answered that question. I'd just like to show a few more forms because yes. I'm aware that we have got another 10 or 15 minutes yes, before yes. we finish, have we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've only got a few forms here, but they're ones that I consider to be so special and so simple and easy to understand, I hope. My idea of simple may not be everybody's idea of simple. But let's start with this one, which is Ooh, yes. uh, the, so this is 10, ten spheres. Yeah. And this, this form in circles is what the Pythagoreans called the... Terracus? Oh, they called Terracus? Terracus. That's Terracus. Something, yeah, I think that's right. Now you've got me, I've got a memory <laughs> And they, they saw this as being an extremely important form. They were obsessed with the number 10. But to me, it's the circles and the way they fit together, which is most important. And this is actually a tetrahedron mm. with the spheres stacked as closely together as you can stack spheres. And because this is as close as you can get spheres to stack, they will naturally do this. Spheres of energy or spheres of energy around a particle in the atom and so on will naturally cluster in this sort of form because 
it's the path of least resistance. It's the most symmetrical forms you can get. And it's the most stable, coherent energy states that you can form. So this is where the journey begins for me with circles and spheres and the way they fit together most comfortably. So within this form, when you extend it to infinity and all, you extend that out layer by layer to infinity. That's what Buckminster Fuller called the isotropic vector matrix. It's a very simple thing. It's just this idea of making triangular patterns out of spheres and circles and letting it continue forever. And then in 3D, you get around the central sphere, you have 12 spheres surrounding it that form the vector equilibrium is what Buckminster Fuller called it. Um, it's called the cube octahedron in, in Western geometry. And in many ways, this is more important than the five platonic solids because it's, we, we focus on the platonic solids because of their symmetry. But this one is the more complete symmetry. It has um, 12 directions coming out from the central direction. And it's the way that spheres cluster. So, and when you take this out layer by layer in the clustering spheres, you then get the 64 tetrahedron grid, which was Nassim Haramein's contribution of saying, continuing Buckminster Fuller's work and saying that at this level of complexity of the triangular grid, you get a combination of all the basic shapes from the dodecahedron, sorry, the octahedron at the center, the cube octahedron, you get cubes, you get tetrahedrons, and they all crystallize into this form that is very worth studying, sorry, very worth studying in terms of uh, subatomic structure and crystalline structure and so on. Um, that will probably do in that little journey yeah. through geometry. I just want to give you a bit more of what is in the book and the geometric side of uh, what I feel that everybody should understand because it really isn't complex stuff. It's really not rocket science. It's and yet every rocket scientist should know this. <laughs> they should because this is the foundation of harmonic patterns of and we have to relearn how to work. Well, there's a lot in that harmonic patterns to do with accessing energy from the universe is done through harmony and resonance. But there's also just the, the universe is harmonic. The structures are like that. And if we can learn to use that and work with that and mimic the processes of nature, then we'll solve most of the problems that we've created in the last uh, hundred years. Whether you go to Rome or Babylon or mm. even or Egypt or further, um, we seem to have taken a difficult path somewhere along the way, and I feel like sacred geometry is part of putting us back on a harmonic path, and that the human consciousness needs to understand these things to go to the next level of understanding what reality is. And that this is the only way we're going to get through the problems we're facing at the moment, that logic does not get us there. Arguing about what's real doesn't get us there. We have to get to a new level of consciousness where we can see deeper into reality and get past the dogmas and the uh, differences of how we describe things and the languages and come down to the agreement about this mysterious place and this mystery of our own lives and accept what is at a deeper level. 
Yes, and, and see it more as a unity than division, because I feel like a humanity, mm. yeah, with the masters of limitations, <laughs> and mm. uh, we see everything uh, a lot in boxes, and uh, especially currently with the whole, um, yeah, mass hysteria, there's much more division happening. So really, I feel like geometry and sacred geometry or universal geometry, it's it represents that everything actually is connected, everything is unified. We're all part of a of a of a energetic grid. We're all part of the earth. Mm. So one anyway. It's very interesting to me that the current crisis is polarizing people's belief systems, and yet, in one sense, that's that's creating this intensity of the crisis and the intensity of. But in another sense, at the polarization, it's also meeting. There's this blending over from everyone's being red pilled and whether you're far left or far right you're starting to have to see the other point of view because it's all so extreme that you you're going to go insane unless you let in the other polarize the other polarity of the story of what is going on yes <laughs> uh. All right. Okay. So I'd like to um, finish with five more questions. I call them the hot five. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and you're just going to choose one. Yeah. So uh, what do you uh, believe in more that the universe uh, comes from mind or matter? I have to choose one. Yes. <laughs> You can also choose both, but you have to explain. So. Well, that was the one. I, I'll choose that one. Then. <laughs> mind and matter. What came first, mind or matter? Yeah, I, I've had an ongoing argue, argument with a friend of mine about this, and uh, I've I've actually read both sides of the argument in some depth quite recently. I've and and there are scientists who believe on both sides of this story. So I tend to lean towards the mind is more primary. I think the Buddhists say mind, everything starts with mind. Mind matters most is the um, <laughs> quick answer. Uh, but it's interesting, the two arguments. And one is that mind is, that matter somehow generates mind. And I have real trouble understanding that one. So I've read some of the best philosophers who argue that, and I still disagree with them. I think that, but the mainstream story of Western science is that for countless billions of years, we had a dead universe. There was nothing living in it. There was only energy and matter and things carrying on, planets whirling around, stars in galaxies and not a single mind to perceive it. If you go into quantum, um, physics, then you could say that none of that had really crystallized. It was all just energetic possibilities because the quantum waveform needs somebody to perceive it in order to collapse the probability field into an actual reality. And I used to think that was a sort of new age interpretation of quantum mechanics, but recently I've gone back and going, there are scientists who seriously do say that consciousness is absolutely fundamental and there is no reality until you have consciousness. There was no uh, dead universe that gave rise to consciousness. Somehow, though we still don't understand what it is and how it works, conscious, that spark of consciousness has to be there in order for you to perceive anything that could be called space, time, reality or matter. Yes. And then it still leaves you with the question, where did that come from? How did that get here? And for me, there's always that question in sacred geometry is, what is this the door to? Like this is still, wh where is this information coming from? The geometry is the structure. It's the, and through that structure, we understand reality. But there's still the question, the great mystery of where does it all come from and what does it all mean? Because we can go infinitely deep into that question. And I've never trusted anyone who said they know the answer to no. that question. 
<laughs> I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, what do you resonate more then, with science or philosophy in general? Most of these polarized questions, I, I really have trouble picking left <laughs> or right because I really feel that it's in the meeting of the two that you get everything. Um, there's been a sort of movement back and forth between the two that you can trace through the ages as well, which one of my favorite books is called The Big Bang Never Happened. And part of his argument is that as culture becomes more restrictive, you get more a science that says the universe had a beginning. And as, as culture gets more open-minded and uh, less dogmatic and there's more freedom, you tend to get sciences that say there was no beginning, it's eternal and infinite. Yes. That brings me actually to the next question. Is it chaotic, a chaos that brought this universe into existence, like um, probably mainstream science things, or is it a divine blueprint? I'm hesitating to call it a divine blueprint and I'm asking myself why because I do have my own personal relationship with the divine in all its forms and in its infinite form and so on. And if consciousness comes first then I guess I lean towards the blueprint form of it but Chaos is an amazing thing too, and I can't say that one ever existed without the other, or that the, the divine is not equally chaotic as it is a structured blueprint, because really what you're saying, is it chaos or is it order? And for life to exist, life exists on that boundary between chaos and order. If things are too structured, there's not enough chaos for life to do its thing. And you see this in the geometric patterns. Remember, what I was talking about before is very much the 60 and the 90 degree geometries, but the five sided geometries are the ones that create the DNA and the life structures, and they don't fit into the 60, 90 degree grid of matter comfortably. They fit there, but they have to be sort of rotate. They have to move. They have to spin. They have to adapt to the grid of space time. So yeah. that's why I can't choose between <laughs> chaos and uh, divine blueprint. It's probably both. And maybe there's order coming out of it's, chaos. <laughs> yeah, it's usually both, I find. Yeah. Um, so what is uh, your favorite study then? Is it geometry or music? Music's more fun yeah. <laughs> when you play it. Uh, I'll just go with music on that one. <laughs> okay, yeah, music, okay. <laughs> yeah. One, of the, one of these days I hope to have enough time, have, have accomplished enough of the projects I want to, to get back to playing music because music's such a direct, pleasurable thing, whereas geometry is study it's it's uh and it's it's wonderful to learn and to go deeper into reality but music is like dancing with reality so yes yeah. nice okay and the last one uh sphere or cube which one would you choose it's almost like the order and chaos isn't it? it's <laughs> yeah. very um, you could call chaos is the undifferentiated, all dire omnidirectional expansion. And the cube in many ways is the opposite of that. Although I'd say the tetrahedron, which fits inside the cube is probably closer to the opposite of that. Um, so I'd probably go with sphere because cube involves all the other geometries too, whereas sphere is the whole thing at once. And hypospheres of what got me into doing the hypercube originally was you'd read in all these books, oh, you can't draw a hyper, hypersphere because just as you can't really draw a sphere, you can shade it, you can draw some circles going around the sphere, but you can't draw the sphere. So in the same way, they're saying you can't draw a hypersphere. And that took me to going, well, 
what if you start with a hypercube and you cut off the corners to create a hypercube octahedron and then you cut off the corners of that again and you're to you're slowly rounding out the cubes in inside the hypercube wouldn't you end up with something that was rather hyperspherical <laughs> so right from the very beginning of my journey with journey with sacred geometry it has been very much about the sphere and the cubes so Yes. Uh, interesting that you should point that out to me again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyway, there's so many um, infinite possibilities in approaching the subject, I feel like, um, especially last time we talked about also the nesting of the solids. And yeah, there's uh, so many ways and how things can fit together. And if you can look at it from the top down or the from the bottom to the, to the up approach, and uh, either way, there are so many things to explore, and it's an infinite mm. mystery and an infinite I mean, way of really, exploration. It's really good to be able to hold at the same time the top down and the bottom up approach as one whole thing. I think if you're only looking at it one way, you're not seeing the whole thing. Yes. Mm. Well, <laughs> so we're coming to the end. Uh, it's been a very very big pleasure to meet you <laughs> so i should mention my website yes. again i guess yes um uh, let me remind myself i've got so many websites i actually have to remind myself so the book's website is understandingsacredgeometry.com and i have a shop uh which sells the the uh jewelry and many other things as well as the book and it's called sacredgeometrical.com. I, I loved, I only discovered a few years ago that I could make nice. 3D printed jewelry out of things like this six dimensional cube. So that sort of thing is at sacredgeometrical.com. And from there you can find me in all sorts of other places, especially Facebook where our sacred geometry group, which is where Heike found me um, a few <laughs> weeks ago. Um, if you search for Understanding Sacred Geometry on Facebook, you'll find the Facebook group there. Yes, I actually posted. So I'd love to um, see you. Yes, I uh, posted also the link uh, of the book. So if you would like to purchase the book, the link is also already in the text. You can get there. Directly. I think it's so important that all these people into sacred geometry around the world link up and start to connect to each other. Yes. It's like watching a dot to dot painting assembling into some higher dimensional form yes absolutely we may not be able to travel physically anymore <laughs> but at least we can use the internet <laughs> <laughs> so yes thank you narada vantari for this very very beautiful interview and i'm sure we'll hear much more of you and i'm looking forward to read your book um so for all those who'd like to study more with me i have the next workshop coming up on saturday about um 40 thinking so if you're interested in how to use geometry and apply it with your thoughts and to gain a different perspective of life um saturday is the next workshop right um yeah uh, i'd like to say goodbye <laughs> and uh Thanks, Heike. It's been a pleasure chatting with you again. Yes, I see you soon. And I look forward to many future chats. Absolutely. <laughs>